All right. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to the Las Vegas B-Sides Proving Ground track. A few announcements before we get started. I'd like to take uh, an opportunity first to thank our sponsors. Uh, first of all, our diamond sponsors, Last Pass and Palo Alto, as, long, as well as our gold sponsors, Intel, Invisium, and Blue Cat. Uh, without their support and the support of all the volunteers and sponsors and other donors, we wouldn't be able to have these amazing talks, come see all these amazing people, and uh, get together like this and have this uh, awesome conference. So a huge thank you to all those people. Uh, a reminder right now, if you have a cell phone, to please take it out from wherever it is and put it on silent. Uh, this is a, out of a respect for the speaker. And then also we will be recording this. So we don't want to get any of those cell phone sounds on the recording. In addition to recording, this will be live streamed. And so a uh, quick reminder, uh, our photography policy is you, are, uh, you should not be taking any photographs unless you have the consent of everybody in the room. Uh, that includes slides, unless the speaker specifically says that that's okay. Um, questions uh, will be, if you don't mind, hold your questions until the end. Uh, I will come around with the microphone so that you can talk, uh, speak into the microphone. That way we can get the question, your question on the stream and on the recording. And then lastly, um, we are requiring masks. If you need to take it off to have a sip of a drink or, or eat something real quick, that's fine but otherwise, please keep your masks on at all times. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mike Lisi and his presentation on how to succeed as a freelance pen tester. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Uh, thanks for coming. It's a really good turnout. I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised. I'm here to talk today about freelance pen testing. A uh, quick note about me, uh, Mike Lacey, at Mike Hacks Things on Twitter. I do penetration testing. I have a couple certifications, OSCP, GWAPT, uh, CEH. I am the founder of Maltech Solutions, which is the company that I established for my freelance pen testing. Uh, I also work as the CTF design lead for the NCAE Cyber Games, which is a collegiate cybersecurity competition. Uh, and I am the co-organizer of a security meetup group called uh, IthacaSec, and that's in upstate uh, New York. So a quick note before we begin, uh, I'm going to be covering a lot of different uh, aspects on creating the business and talking about freelance pen testing, but uh, it's important to know I'm not a lawyer. This isn't legal advice. This isn't financial advice. Uh, you're responsible to do your own due diligence and understand what works for you in your individual, individual circumstances. So just take that into mind as we move forward. So if you're interested in pursuing the freelance work, there's a few important questions that you need to answer. Um, and these are to kind of make sure that you're ready to jump into freelancing. So first off, why do you want to do it? Why do you want to become a freelance pen tester? Your answer is going to be unique to yourself. For me, I had the opportunity to work uh, on the NCAA Cyber Games but I was a full-time consultant at the same time, and th there wasn't enough time for me to do a full-time job for that, the part-time job for the education, and then still have time for family, friends, hobbies, things like that. So freelancing was an opportunity for me to pursue all those things while making it under my terms. Um, but for you, I mean, there's obvious benefits if you're interested in freelancing. Uh, some of those benefits are, you know, you get to decide when you work, how much you work, who you're working for, what you're doing. Um, big benefits, but there's downsides to consider too. You're going to have to make sure that you can uh, get through the times when there's not enough work available. Uh, how are you going to handle those situations? Uh, you may be working with clients that you don't necessarily like or get along with, but they provide a lot of work. Um, things like that, you, got, you have to be ready for those things. And you have to find the work. It's not going to be provided to you. You know, unlike with a regular job, you have tasking that gets presented to you, have you uh, to have you do. Not not the case with freelancing. You got to do a lot of work to get that work. Um, so if you've decided, okay, that's all fine. I still want to do it. Um, let's talk about you know preparation. 
if you have experience as a pen tester, you probably have an idea of what your strengths are. You know, what kind of tests that you can do, what kind of work you can do. Um, so identify those. Make sure, you know, that you've established what you're able to offer. You know, are you an app tester? Do you work in cloud environments? Uh, do you like breaking medical devices? This helps you establish, you know, your client base, who you're going to go after to get some of that work. Um, for me, I mainly do web app pen testing. I do external pen testing. There's a lot of work available in those areas. Um, so depending on where your expertise is, you have to identify how much work there is to pursue. Outside of, you know, the specific technical strengths, there's a lot of soft skill type things that you need to, to be aware of too. Um, are you able to talk to clients? Can you establish relationships? Can you define, you know, how to uh, approach testing, how to uh, get all the documentation in place? Uh, do you know what your clients need? Can you identify those by having discussions with the client? You know, what are their goals? What are their concerns? You know, are they worried about user data breaches? Are they use, uh, worried about PII, uh, health information, credit cards? You know, all these are very specific to the customer, and you need to have an understanding of what those are when you approach them to get work. On the non-technical side, are you ready? Are you financially prepared? You know, how long can you go until the invoices start rolling in? You know, you may not have work day one when you start on this path. Uh, you have to be prepared for that. Work isn't consistent. There's going to be, uh, especially in the pen testing world, there's going to be ebbs and flows when there's a lot of work and when there's not a lot. Um, what, how are you going to approach things like benefits, retirement, time off, you know, all these things that are established and coordinated with a typical job, when you're freelancing, it's all kind of falling back on you. There's legal uh, aspects to consider too. A lot of contracts, a lot of legal documentation, agreements, things like that with the clients. Uh, you have to be ready to approach those uh, situations and to be able to handle them. You know, initially, I didn't know what I needed to do in this regard. I went to my uh, employer and I basically said, hey, I have this other opportunity. I kind of want to pursue it. I can't do both. Can I be a contractor? And my manager at the time said, oh, sure. You know, what's your rate? What are your terms? Uh, you know, how long are we establishing this relationship for? What, what are we doing? And uh, I was co complete blank. No idea. No idea what I had to do. But thankfully, they were able to help me identify these things, get everything established. I learned a lot in that process. So it's one of these things that you need to, uh, to make sure that you can uh, do when you're setting up these relationships. So the last thing you got to consider is how are you going to find the work, right? The work doesn't just come to you. You have to go after it. So as a pen tester, uh, there's times when there's not consistent work. This is kind of a graph of my workload throughout the year. You know, Q1, Q4, tons of work available. Q2 kind of gets a little bare. You know, I got to make some changes in order to keep going. Uh, things start ramping up again. Uh, so you got to take that in, into account with your budgeting. You know, uh, how are you going to get through that Q2 slump uh, to make it successful? And the other thing to keep in mind is that when you're a freelancer, you're taking on all these other roles and responsibilities that are typically handled by other people in an organization. You know, you have HR, you have legal, sales, marketing, freelancing, that all becomes you. So outside of the technical, uh, technical knowledge that you need to know, you need to start uh, getting acquainted with these other concepts. But okay, you know you want to do this. None of that stuff scares you. That's fine. You're ready to learn all that or you know it. Great. You're ready for the change. So what do you do next? You got to get set. Uh, I'm going to go over a few things here that are basically required, but they take time, they take effort, they take money, but they're all required to get started. Uh, you've heard the saying, there's no such thing as a free lunch. That's how it is in business. It, all these things cost money, but they're really necessary, and you'll understand why. So first up, uh, you want to create a company, not a DBA, uh, do business as. That's just basically, hey, I, I can do this work. You want to have a legal entity, something like an LLC or an S Corp. Why? Uh, CYA. You know, if you know what that is. You know, cover your ass, right? Uh, having a company protects you as an individual gives the company the legal responsibility for the work that you're doing. So if during a penetration test, you, you know, something catastrophic happens, you take down a whole data center, client's pissed, they're going to sue you. If you don't have a legal company in place, 
then you are personally liable for that stuff. So if you have a house, if you have other assets, you know, all those are on the line. You don't want to take that risk if you want to go into the, into the freelance world. So creating a company kind of helps protect you in that regard. A company does some other things too. It, it, it legitimizes what you're doing, right? If you're just saying, hey, I'm a pen tester, okay, that's great. But now you say, hey, I'm a pen tester, I have a company set up, all this other stuff. The companies, that, the clients that you go after, they're gonna be like, okay, yeah, I, I get it. And you have, you know, you've, you've gone through the legwork of establishing a company and everything. So that, you know, I'm, I'm more willing to, to work with you on that. Uh, doing so really kind of varies by where you establish the company, right? Uh, different states have different requirements. Uh, there's paperwork involved, there's renewal fees. You know, the research that I've, saw, that I've done uh, has ranges between like 120 bucks and $1,000 to establish the company and maintain it throughout, you know, year to year. So depending on where you're looking to establish it, there's gonna be a cost associated with it. Uh, next, you wanna get business insurance. Some companies won't even work with you if, you, if you're not insured, right? They wanna make sure that they're covered too. If your company, you know, isn't worth anything, and you screw up and they sue you, you know, having insurance means that they, they have some comfort in knowing that you know, if something goes wrong, they'll be compensated in some way. Uh, so it's on you to make sure that you have the insurance established. The other thing that it does is it, um, it has extra protections in place where contracts don't cover, right? So you're gonna have legal contracts that you know, absolve you of different things and, and they, they dictate the terms, but in areas where, there's aren't, where there isn't coverage on that, insurance really helps. So it's basically layered protection, right? We talk about defense in depth and InfoSec. This is like protection depth. So you have the company, that's one you know, co way of covering yourself. Business insurance is another way. Um, the types of policies to look into, you know, that's, uh, you're looking at like commercial general liability. It's protecting you against you know, bodily injury, property damage, uh, liable, advertising mistakes, things like that. Um, policies on that, you're looking into like one to $2 million worth of coverage. Um, it's relatively cheap though, it's about 350 bucks a year. The next one, probably one of the most important ones, the errors and omissions. Again, you're looking at one to $2 million worth of coverage, maybe more depending on the clients, uh, about $750 a year. But what that one does is if a client claims that you were negligent in some way or your work was inadequate, um, then this insurance kind of policy helps cover that. So, you know, in a pen testing world, uh, you missed an O-day, something got released after you did a test, client got breached, now they come after you because you didn't find it, right? Uh, the insurance policy helps cover in those situations. Finally, you have like professional liability. Again, you know, million dollars, two million dollars. Uh, that covers against misrepresentations, inaccurate advice, things like that. Um, there's a lot of things to cover on the insurance side. So one way to approach this is looking into insurance agents, right? I use uh, Hiscox, that's a really big player in that. They know, you know the type of insurance that is ideal for these types of things. Um, other agencies may be beneficial to look into too. You need a lawyer. Uh, specifically, you want a lawyer that understands business and contract law, somebody that understands penetration testing, all the legal aspects and requirements associated with that. You know, you want a lawyer that works for you, right? They're going to watch out for your best interests. So why? You know, we're CYA, right? We're, there's a kind of a theme going here. Um, they're going to be able to review all the legal documents that you're getting established when you're setting up a relationship with a business. You know, everything's done over these legal contracts. MSAs, scopes of work, uh, NDAs, all these things, all this legal uh, uh, verbiage in there. Um, your lawyer will review that, they'll make sure that you're being represented correctly and in your best interests, and it helps to make sure that both sides are in agreement as to how to move forward. So I've had uh, agreements in place that were provided to me from clients, and they had provisions of things like, hey, any, any tools, any scripts, anything that you create while you're doing any work for us belongs to us, we get a royalty-free license forever. And I was like, no, that's, you can have ownership over the reports, Anything like that, that makes sense, but anything that I create is mine. Uh, so my lawyer caught that in the contract review, they amended it, the company was totally fine with it too. They said, yeah, that's not really what we were going for, but you know, their lawyer put it in. So you know, having a lawyer on your side is, is really beneficial. But the costs on the lawyer, it can vary. So you know, I mentioned before creating the company. Uh, there's lawyers that'll set that up for you. I had my lawyer create my company and everything for me. They handled all the paperwork all the uh, documentation for it. 
Um, so there's a fees, you know, fees associated with that, maybe a few thousand dollars. Uh, and then you have an ongoing retainer with your lawyer. Basically, you give them a pot of money, and anytime you need their services, they withdraw from that pool uh, to work for you. And then, you know, whatever the agreement that you have with them, you refresh that uh, as needed. So a uh, lawyer's a big help. It, it saves you a lot of time, a lot of money on understanding all the legal implications that you're agreeing to when you're looking to do freelance testing. You also want an accountant, not a tax guy, not somebody that'll just file your taxes for you. Um, somebody that really understands all the tax laws because they're insanely complicated, right? So when you're working for a company and you're a, a, a full-time employee, there's things like payroll taxes, right? You pay half of them as an employee, the employer pay, pays half. When you go into freelancing, you're responsible for that total amount. So there's extra taxes that you end up having to account for. A CPA really helps you with that. Um, you're gonna have payments that you have to make, right? You're getting paid directly from the client. There's no withholdings. So every quarter, you're gonna have to make payments based on the income uh, and your CPA will help you define what that needs to be. Um, there's benefits to take advantage of too. When you're self-employed, there's a lot of write-offs. Uh, things like the equipment that you use, the software you use, if you have cloud hosting, uh, mileage for uh, uh, meeting with clients, all those things can be taken into, into consideration and the CPA helps you identify those things and make sure they're accounted for so that you know, you know what you can, uh, you can claim, what you can't claim, making sure you're playing by the rules because you know, at the end of the day, the government wants their cut, they don't care. Uh, having somebody that actually understands it is the best way to go and they're relatively cheap. You know, mine, uh, is about $500 a year for all the services they provide for my personal, my business taxes, my wife's taxes. It's, it's really not a huge expense and it's a huge like burden to be absolved of. So, um, you know, summarizing that, there's a couple things here. We have the business creation, you know, 100 to 1,000 bucks. Legal side, one to $5,000, counting, insurance, you know. So all your startup fees essentially for the, for the freelancing could be in the area of five to 10,000 depending on your unique situation. Okay, so we talked about why you want to do it. We got some things established on, you know, how to get ready for it. Uh, the last thing before you take the leap is work, right? How do you get the work? Where do you get the customers? As a pen tester, one of the best ways to go about it is subcontracting, right? A lot of consultancies, they have uh, ebbs and flows in the work that they have available or that they need to get done. Uh, similarly, like the, according to the chart, like I showed before, that you know, Q4 uh, craziness in work, a lot of companies face that. So they typically don't always have enough work to hire a full-time person, so they'll, so they'll subcontract it out. Uh, basically, the nice part about this is you don't have to go find clients to do the work. The, the companies already have it ready, they just need somebody to do it. So that's where you can come in. Uh, you still basically have to interview with these companies. They wanna make sure that you're a good fit, that you're technically capable, that you're able to do the job. Uh, you can follow their, their guidelines, their procedures as they relate to things like reporting, client communications, things like that. Um, but there's also some additional things to take into consideration when you're looking into subcontracting. Uh, you wanna talk about rates, you wanna talk about terms, uh, scope, statement of work, reporting and communication, your availability, right? Because it's on your terms now as far as when you're gonna be available, but you need to communicate these with anybody that you're looking to subcontract with because they wanna know, are you able to, are you gonna be there when I actually need you for the work? So you need to, to discuss all those things. Um, it's definitely a great way to get started. It, it relieves some of the pressure of finding the work. Um, it's not quite as profitable as some of the other methods of getting work, but if you're looking to get into it, this is, this is definitely a great approach. But I mentioned rates here, so that's one thing that I really wanted to take a, a moment here to kind of discuss. You know, when you're freelancing, you have to understand that you're not working 100% of the time all year. So you need to figure out what your rate's going to be according to, you know, all those uh, specific factors. So calculating your rate, you know, one way to approach it is take like a target salary for like a position, like a pen tester. Um, you divide it you know, by 48 and divide it again by 40 to get kind of like an hourly rate. And that hourly rate, you wanna double that. So you know, let's say for example, target is 150,000 a year. Uh, weekly, it's uh, what, 3,100. Gets you an hourly rate of $75. So a, a good rate to go about 
you know, as a pen tester is starting at $150 an hour. Um, that helps you cover the times when you're not working and to take into account all of the administrative work that is part of getting the work uh, established. So, you know, things like having the discussions with clients, setting up work, discussing everything, you know, all those things you want to calculate in. So having, you know, a rate that makes sense is going to help you be successful. Um, but, you know, not all, all, all uh, companies that are willing to subcontract are going to meet your rate. They're not going to be agree uh, agreeable to it just because they don't have the budget for that. So you have to make a decision there. Like, do you accept a lower rate if they're giving you more consistent work? Does that make sense? Or is it just not going to be a good relationship? So things to take into consideration if you're going the subcontract route. Direct work is the other uh, method to pursue. It's harder to get because you're essentially reaching out to those end clients that need to have the work done. Um, there's a lot of overhead, a lot of administrative work because you know this is where you become the salesperson, right? You're trying to sell your services, what you're able to do and how it's going to help them. Uh, you need to understand and discuss their needs, uh, where you can help, and then you have to also handle all of that documentation that I mentioned before. You know, they, they may want like a proposal, they may want a scope of work, uh, they want pricing, you know, you want to take all that stuff and uh, you're going to need to know how to do that for the direct work. But on the plus side, it's more profitable. You're going to make more money on that just because there's no middleman in between you and the end client, right? There's no company taking a cut uh, for themselves. So the other way to go about it is networking. This has been one of the best ways that I've found work. Uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, the, the NetSec Reddit, subreddit. Um, you know, when you, when you see a lot of job postings and there's companies that are looking to hire pen testers, that means typically that they have a lot more work to do than they can handle. So, you know, one tip there is to reach out to some of those companies, ask them if they're open to subcontracting. For them, it's kind of a win-win. They can execute on the work, you get some money, and they don't have, like, you know, an employee on their payroll. Um, but this is where a lot of marketing comes into play. You know, how do you approach some of this stuff? Uh, you know, some of the important things to consider is when you have your company having a website, having business cards, having a tire, you know, take into consideration how you're presenting yourself in person, online, because clients that you're looking to work with are going to use all of that to make a decision on whether they want to work with you. Um, so these are important things to, to, uh, to, to think about. Uh, here, even, you know, besides Las Vegas, yesterday, just sitting around talking with a few folks, uh, you know, talking about what I do, they said, hey, we have a need for that. Let's exchange numbers. You know, let's talk about maybe how you can help me. So, you know, conference networking is a huge, huge way to get some work. But main thing here is just your reflection on the company that you create, who you are, what you're doing, and all that stuff is, you know, much more magnified when you're a freelancer, right? You're not, you don't have a company to, to hide behind or, you know, the, the reputation of a company. Um, other things that you want to do is, you know, when you do work with any clients, try and get some testimonials, get some feedback so that you can use that, you know, to sell yourself to other companies that are looking for work. Be like, hey, if you're, you know, if you're looking to do this, I've worked with somebody else. Here's some references. They're happy to talk about it. And this kind of helps establish that you're the right person to do the work with. Uh, so I'm running out of time here. Uh, I really wanted to thank everybody for coming. I hope you found some of this useful. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Mouse and Grant from the uh, Proving Grounds. You know, they helped me a lot with this presentation. Anybody that's looking to do a presentation, I would really recommend going through the Proving Grounds. It's a great experience. Um, you know, I'll be around today, the rest of the day. Uh, I'll be at DEF CON too, so feel free to reach out, say hi. Uh, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn. If you want to talk about any of these things, happy to help, happy to put you in contact with, you know, any resources that I can. Um, but, uh, you know, thank you for uh, stopping by. We've got time for like a question or two, if anybody has one. First of all, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, can everyone hear me? So the question I had for you is, in your opinion or in your experience, how much of the workload is subcontracting and how much of it are companies now starting to bring this discipline in-house? 
So from a company perspective, uh, that's going to vary depending on the company. I know some that are very heavy on the subcontract side, right? They, they prefer to subcontract out a majority of their work. Others are very much just as needed. Um, me personally, I would say about 75% of my work is subcontract and 25% of my work is more direct. I'm hoping to like invert that a little bit, but I went with the approach of the subcontract work to get more business going and to make sure that I could, you know, uh, uh, be successful and you know kind of make sure that I have a gave it a good shot uh, any other questions yeah just feel free to reach me in the hall or whatever um, I'll try and if there's online questions there's probably a way for me to check those out too I don't know I don't know about online questions but oh, yeah, yeah. Um, he'll be out in the hall uh, uh, that's it we ran out of time for questions so another big round of applause for Mike <laughs>